Good evening. I'm Sandy Freeman, the president of Deschutes Public Library Foundation. And I want to tell you about the author of this year's novel idea. Eowyn LeMay Ivy was raised in Alaska and continues to live there with her husband, a fishery biologist, and their two daughters. Miss Ivy's literary leanings got off to an early start when her mother named her after the Lady of Rowan and J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy. The Snow Child is Ms. Ivy's debut novel. In addition to being a Pulitzer Prize finalist for fiction, it has won the following awards and honors. 2013 Indies Choice Award for Debut Fiction, 2012 United Kingdom National Book Award Winner of Inter Winner <coughs> International Author of the Year, and 2013 Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association Book Award winner. Miss Ivy has written essays and short fiction that have appeared in London's Observer Magazine, Sunday Times Magazine, Woman and Home Magazine, Sunday Express Magazine, the anthology Cold Flashes, the North Pacific Rim Literary Journal Cirque, Five Chapters, and Alaska Magazine. Before her career as a novelist and bookseller at Fireside Books in Palmer, Alaska, Ms. Ivy worked for nearly a decade as an award-winning reporter at the Frontiersman newspaper. Her weekly articles about her outdoor adventures earned her best non-daily columnist award from the Alaska Press Club. Ms. Ivey earned her BA in journalism and creative writing through Western Washington University's honors programs and studied creative nonfiction in the graduate program at the University of Alaska Anchorage. She is a contributor to the blog 49 Writers and a founding member of Alaska's first statewide writing program. The Snow Child is informed by Eowyn's life in Alaska. While both she and her husband work outside the home, they are also raising their daughters in the rural, largely subsistence lifestyle in which they were both raised. As a family, they harvest salmon and wild berries, keep a vegetable garden, and raise turkeys and chickens. They also hunt caribou, bear, and moose for meat. Because they don't have a well and live outside any public water system, they haul water each week for their holding tank and ga gather rainwater for their animals and garden. Their primary source of home heat is a wood stove, and they cut and stack their own wood. I wonder how she finds time to write. <laughs> These activities are important to Eowyn's day-to-day -day life as well as the rhythm of her year. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce this year's A Novel Ideas award-winning author, Eowyn Ivey. Wow, this is absolutely amazing. I have to say, this is the, the biggest crowd that I've had in front of me for the book. You guys are phenomenal. Thank you so much. I, I mean, really, somehow you all managed to make, I, I was watching the video um, that you were all watching, and I think somehow you all make uh, authors feel like rock stars in your community. <laughs> and it doesn't happen most places, I have to tell you this. And to have, uh, I'm very excited about to take back to my 14-year-old daughter the picture of my name up on the marquee on the theater. It's just fantastic. But really, I mean, I, I, I had a feeling it was going to be fabulous when 
weeks ago, um, I started posting a little bit that I was going to be coming here, and I was getting email, emails and Facebook messages, um, literally from around the country, people saying, you all have the best community reads program in the country. Um, and I really believe it now being here. I really do. I, and, and it's, absolutely, you get a hand in that. And I think it's a difficult, you know, having worked as a bookseller, it's not an easy task. I think there's a lot of people that are readers, but to bring the community into it, and I mean, everything from the music, thank you so much to the Quincy Street Band, fabulous, to the, I went to the Quilt Works um, fabric store, it's got to see the quilts up, amazing. And I also got to go to the A6 gallery and see their artwork, um, some of it based on the Snow Child and then their books. I mean, it's, and what's really fabulous about it, I think, is that, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but my book came to me as an inspiration by looking at a little children's paperback book that told the story of Snegorochka. And as I researched it, I discovered that it has a long history in Russia that inspired paintings, Russian lacquer, paintings on little boxes, um, an opera, a ballet. And then I wrote a book, and then the idea that art is beginning art is beginning art is just a really moving experience. And um, I mean, to see the quilts and all the different interpretations and the things that people took away from it and with the artwork, it's just, it's a really incredible welcome from a community um, for an author. And I just really applaud you all for doing such a fabulous job and for turning up and supporting your libraries like this. And thank you, of course, huge thank you to Deschutes Public Libraries for bringing this um, together every year and, and making us feel so welcome. It's really fabulous. Thank you. It's really wonderful. So what I'm really hoping to do tonight, um, I'm really not much of a lecturer by nature, and I start to get sound, tired of the sound of my own voice. So what I want to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I came to the Snow Child, the process a little bit, um, why the story drew me in. And then I want to read a couple short sections um, uh, uh, just to kind of share that with you. And then I'm really hoping that maybe there's some questions from the audience. That kind of is it's more fun for me to sort of interact with you all. So whether you have questions about the book or about um, my publishing route, those of you who might be writing, writers, um, or my life in Alaska, book selling, all those things. I, I want to talk with you about what you're interested in. So I hope that maybe as I'm, as I'm doing the rest of the presentation, you can all be thinking of some questions to share with me, which would make it a lot more fun for me. So as I was saying, um, uh, it was a little children's paperback book. I, I feel like along the course for The Snow Child, um, some really lucky, fortunate blessings have come my way. And as a part of that, I spent um, about 10 years working as a newspaper reporter at the Frontiersman newspaper. But never was it really my passion. I was never someone who was just dying to read the morning newspaper or read a lot of magazines. In my spare time, I was reading novels. That was my passion. And I had grown up in a family um, that was always reading. I, I always joke that my husband and I, we've been dating since I was in high school. And he would come over to our house and he would say, it's like a library in here. Because everyone had a book in their hand, even if the TV was on. I don't know why we always had the TV on, because we were all reading at the same time. So it was very much just a part of me growing up. And I, but as I was doing newspaper work, I realized it really wasn't the kind of writing I was passionate about. And so I made the decision to go to work at our little small town independent bookstore, Fireside Books. And it was really a fortunate decision, um, because suddenly I found myself surrounded by readers and books and ideas. And it was very inspiring. And it gave me the kind of um, creative energy at the end of the day to want to write. And then I stumbled on that little children's paperback. And it was actually um, illustrated by Barbara Lavallee, an Alaskan artist who I really admire. But somehow I had never seen this little, this little book. I have lots of children's books. I have two daughters, and I'm always finding new Alaska children's books. But this was one I had never seen before. And it just told that really simple storyline of an old man and a woman who can't have children. Um, and one night they build a little girl out of snow, and she comes to life. And there were a lot of interesting coincidences at the time I was pregnant with my second daughter, um, and it was, it was in the wintertime, and I was in the bookstore by myself, um, just shelving books, and it was very quiet in the evening, getting ready to close up. And as I read it, I, I actually got this kind of tingly sensation, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is it. This is the story I really want to tell. And the, and the kind of unfortunate thing is I had been spending, um, oh gosh, close to five years on a completely different novel um, that wasn't working. And I, I was coming to this conclusion, but I felt like, gosh, it's so flaky to abandon something you've put so much time into. And so sometimes I kind of joke, it was, I felt like I was having an affair on my novel because I would, I would spend my time doing the good thing and I would work on this first novel and I would just drudge through it. And then I would kind of sneak over and be over there Googling Snegorochka and looking at these beautiful Russian lacquer paintings and finally, I said, you know what, this is where my heart is, and I just have to follow the sleep. 
And so I started writing the book, and it, it came to me very quickly. I think for a lot of reasons. One is、um, I was so excited about the idea. I think all along I had been looking for a way to write about Alaska that, that, that had something unique for me, that, that gave it a, a voice that I wanted. And what it was was realizing it is fiction, and there can be magic. I can do this,、um, and it kind of opened up this whole new door as far as the novel. The other thing that was really fortunate is my mom's a poet, and she had just decided that she wanted to spend more time writing poetry. So we made a commitment to each other, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm I'm very deadline driven. <laughs> If I have a deadline, I'll get something done. And so every week, I said I would give her a new chapter, and and she would give me a new poem. Now, granted, they were rough, and we made a rule that we could only say what we liked about it. We wouldn't say anything bad because we just wanted to keep each other going, and we wouldn't lie, but we'd find the things in it that we liked, and we really kept each other going. And after about oh, I think. I'm thinking it was in June when the Kachemak Bay Writers Conference came to Alaska and Homer, Alaska. There's a really fabulous writing conference, and my mom and I went to it. And I was about three quarters of the way done with the manuscript. And this was another one of those those choices you make where you choose a path.、Um, and to even go to the conference was sort of a leap for me to take the time off and get down there. But then I realized the agent who was there. I recognized some of the books that he represented:、um, Art of Racing in the Rain,、um, Ducks and Slave. And I thought. Wow, he's the real deal. He's here in Alaska, and he's a literary agent from New York. And my mom said, "You should go talk to him about your book." And I said, "No, mom, it's not even done yet, and I'm not ready." But my mom gets credit in this too. She kept saying, "Just go talk with him." And so I did. I signed up for a little 15-minute slot to talk about the book with him, and he said, I- "I'd like to read it." And I said, "Oh no, I didn't bring a manuscript with me." <laughs> Because I wasn't even—I was really going to learn more about the craft. I wasn't going with publishing in mind, and so I went through a big rigmarole. I called my husband、um, in Chickaloon, which is the little town. It's not even really a town. It's this little community that we live in, and the library. This is a plug for libraries, actually. The, the nearest library is about 15 miles away. It's a very small library called Sutton Public Library, and we don't have a fax machine.、Um, so I told my husband. Take these pages down, and I told him where they were, and I said, "Take them down to Sutton Public Library and fax them here to the hotel. A hundred pages." <laughs> And the librarian was very sweet and helpful, but the pages never arrived. And so this this New York agent, who I've come to love and respect very much, but is kind of waiting there impatiently, like, "Yeah, re- you really have a manuscript? Let's see it."、Um, later on, we found out that it had gotten stuck in some pages that the person there at the hotel was printing out. So it was kind of in this big stack. Anyways, eventually he read the manuscript that night. Actually, we got it to him, and the next morning he offered to represent it, and it was、um, it was. It was dreamlike, and I and it was again. What if I hadn't gone to that conference? What if I hadn't found that little fairy tale book? All the kind of things that felt like they came into place for this book. And my mother, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Here's to moms of the world, absolutely. <laughs> No, absolutely, and I think even going all the way back to when she was reading me poems when I was a little girl and sharing books with me, absolutely. And so、um, then, the, since then, it has just been a tremendous ride. It's been amazing and wonderful, and I think we're up to. Like 25 languages and 30 some countries, and so to get,、um, I think especially, you know, first and foremost, I'm a reader, and so the feeling when I get an email or I talk with some of you and you talk about connecting with the book, it's just it's an amazing feeling for me because that's what I love about books is feeling connected to other places, other people, and realizing sort of the similarities despite the differences of landscape or differences of history,、um, the commonalities that we all share. So it's been a really、um, Moving and amazing experience for me. So I want to read a few passages here、um, to start out with. One of the things I ended up doing in this book, and I was I was talking with some of you a little bit, I think, earlier about this, is that I I started out very much basing it in the Matanuska Valley, which is where I grew up. And the Matanuska River comes out of the Matanuska Glacier、um, and comes through a town right near Palmer,、uh, and then out into the、um, Cook Inlet. And there's a long history there of coal mining, and originally that's the, very much the place I had in mind as I started telling the story, because there were homesteaders coming there in 19, beginning in 1918,、um, and I had some old photographs that showed this. But as I started writing the book, I was becoming just too engrossed in the geography and the maps, and fretting about like, why am I not getting this quite right? Could there have been a road there? Would they have done? And then I had that flash again, just like I did when I came across the fairy tale. This is fiction. I can do whatever I want to. <laughs> so I invented a whole river. The Wolverine River,、um, and people ask me that sometimes. Now there are a couple Wolverine rivers in Alaska, but I'm really much more basing it on the Matanuska River and the history there. 
but I wanted to be free to just do what I wanted to do. So I invented Wolverine River Alaska. And I'm just going to start out and read a, a little section here at the beginning. And, and if, if there are people out here who haven't read it yet, I always feel like I want to warn them. It's, it's a little sad at the beginning, but it gets better, I promise. <laughs> so I'm going to read the opening part here with Mabel. So my story is that basic fairy tale. Um, of an old man and a woman who can't have a child and build a little girl out of snow. But I, I in, in, invented Jack and Mabel, and they are my, um, my fairy tale characters. And they've come to Alaska in 1920 to try to build a new life for themselves, and they're struggling. Um, it's been both physically and emotionally hard for them, and they're, they're having a hard time making a go of it. So I'm just going to read the opening few pages here. Wolverine River, Alaska, 1920. Mabel had known there would be silence. That was the point, after all. No infants cooing or wailing. No neighbor children playfully hollering down the lane. No pad of small feet on wooden stairs worn smooth by generations or clackety-clack of toys along the kitchen floor. All those sounds of her failure and regret would be left behind. And in their place, there would be silence. She had imagined that in the Alaska wilderness, silence would be peaceful like snow falling at night, air filled with promise but no sound. But that was not what she found. Instead, when she swept the plank floor, the broom bristles scritched like some sharp-toothed shrew nibbling at her heart. When she washed the dishes, plates and bowls clattered as if they were breaking to pieces. The only sound not of her making was a sudden caw, caw from outside. Mabel wrung dishwater from a rag and looked out the kitchen window in time to see a raven flapping its way from one leafless birch tree to another. No children chasing each other through autumn leaves, calling each other's names, not even a solitary child on a swing. There had been the one, a tiny thing, born still and silent. Ten years passed, but even now she found herself returning to the birth to touch Jack's arm, stop him, reach out. She should have. She should have cupped the baby's head in the palm of her hand and snipped a few of its tiny hairs to keep in a locket at her throat. She should have looked into that small face and known if it was a boy or a girl and then stood beside Jack as he buried it in the Pennsylvania winter ground. She should have marked its grave. She should have allowed herself that grief. It was a child after all, although it looked more like a fairy changeling, pinched face, tiny jaw, ears that came to narrow points. That much she had seen and wept over because she knew she could have loved it still. And you know what's amazing is I'm reading this now, I'm remembering one of the quilts in the quilt shop um, was ravens. And it's, it's, it's just really amazing to think about the different parts that people have pulled out of the book um, and, and done their own artwork on. It's just really wonderful. Um, and, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, so. Jack has come um, with some background as a farmer. He's grown up in Pennsylvania as a farmer. He's used to that lifestyle, but he's not a hunter by nature. It's not a part of what he grew up doing. Um, and he's looking at having to go to the coal mine to support them. But the neighbors, um, George and Esther, who I have to tell you were a lifesaver for me. I'm so glad they came along. I think both Mabel and I really needed them. <laughs> Um, and, and they were just, I think especially Esther, she was a lifesaver. But they say, you know, if you just get a moose, get some moose meat, you've got potatoes, you can make it through the winter, and then, Jack, you won't have to go to the coal mine. And so Jack has been spending many fruitless days trying to hunt for a moose. And so this is the scene that I'm going to read um, right now. <clears throat> Jack came to a log and made a half-hearted attempt to brush the snow away before sitting on it. He laid the rifle across his knees, took off his wool hat, and ran his fingers through his hair. For some time he sat bent over, his elbows on the rifle, head in his hands. Doubt crouched over his shoulder, ready to take him by the throat, whispering in his ear, you are an old man, an old, old man. If he were to fall dead in these woods, nothing would rush to his aid. The north wind would blow down from the glacier, the ground would stay frozen, and a red fox, like the one he had looked in the eye, might be the first to sniff at his dead body and take a nibble here and there. The ravens and magpies would come to tear away at his frozen flesh. Maybe a pack of wolves would eventually find its way to his carcass, and soon he would be nothing but a strewn pile of bones. His only hope would be Mabel. But then the thought of her struggling under his, dead, under his dead weight brought him to tears. He stood and shouldered his rifle. 
He had only cried a few times in his adult life when his mother died and when he and Mabel lost that little baby. He wouldn't let himself now. He put one foot in front of the other and walked without seeing or feeling. It was the quiet that pulled him out of his gloom, a quiet full of presence. He brought his head up. It was the child. She was before him, just a few yards away. She stood atop the snow, arms at her sides, the hint of a smile at her pale lips. White fur trimmed her coat and leather boots. Her face was framed by the velvety brown of a sable hat, and she wore Mabel's red scarf and mittens. The child was dusted in crystals of ice, as if she had just walked through a snowstorm or spent a brilliantly cold night outdoors. Jack would have spoken to her, but for her eyes, the broken blue of river ice, glacial crevasses, moonlight, they held him. She blinked, her blonde lashes glittering with frost, and darted away. Wait, he called out. He stumbled after her. Wait, don't be afraid. He was clumsy, tripping over his boots and kicking up snow. She sprinted ahead, but stopped often to look back at him. Please, he called again. Wait. A sound came to Jack's ears, like wind stirring dried leaves or snow blowing across ice, or maybe a whisper from far away. Shh. He did not call out again. He ducked beneath tree branches and waded through the snow as the girl led him farther and farther into the forest. He had to watch his feet to keep from tripping, but each time he looked up, she was waiting. And then she wasn't. He stopped, squinted, scanned the snow for her tracks, but he saw no sign. Once again, he became aware of the quiet, the strange calm of the forest. From behind him came a high, chirpy whistle, like a chickadee's call, and he turned, expecting to see a bird, or maybe the child. Instead, a bull moose stood not 50 yards away. It raised its head slowly, as if the massive, many-pointed antlers were a ponderous burden. Snow sprinkled its long nose and brown hackles. It swayed its antlers slowly, side to side. Never had Jack seen such a magnificent animal. On lanky legs, it must have stood more than seven feet at the withers, and its neck was as stout as a tree trunk. In his wonder, Jack nearly overlooked the obvious. This was his quarry. I have to say, too, um, you know, I, I, when I, the, the original fairy tale talks about an, an old man and an old woman. And I get teased about this a little bit, because Jack and Mabel are just entering their 50s. Um, and I just turned 40, so 50 doesn't seem that far away. And now I'm starting to think, you know, 50's not that old at all. But the truth of it is I had to figure out a way to tell a story about a couple who are feeling their age and are at a point in their lives where they can no longer have children, but that they're young enough to actually realistically maybe try to make a go of it, of building a homestead in Alaska. So I kind of watched, walked that line, and I just want everybody to know I really don't think 50's old at all, just so you all know that. <laughs> I want to clarify that just to make sure you all know. One of the fun things, that, and, and there were actually several parts in the book that just sort of came to me unexpectedly. I had a, an outline of the story, I, you know, where I thought it was going to go. Um, and then certain things like George and Esther just kind of spouted out all of a sudden. I didn't even know where they had come from, and I was grateful for them. Another part that was a little bit like that for me were the letters between Mabel and her sister Ada. I, I don't know, I, I never had it in mind to write letters, and yet all of a sudden I kind of found myself doing it, and I really had fun. It was, I, it was just fun to write in, a, in somebody else's voice, and rather than, you know, because most of the book is told in third-person narrative style. Um, so to do that first person, to jump right into their heads, was really fun. So the last part that I want to read um, is a letter. So Mabel has grown up very differently than Jack. Um, Jack was the farmer who had worked a pretty hard life. She had grown up the daughter of a literature professor, um, and was sort of a black sheep in a way in the family in that she had decided to marry this farmer and then run off to Alaska. And most of her family is still back in Pennsylvania, and her sister Ada lives in the family home. And at one point, um, Mabel asks her to send a fairy tale book that she recalls that might be in the home. But this is a letter from Ada, her sister, um, to Mabel there in Alaska. So I just want to read this one real quick. Dear Mabel, your letters and sketches have become quite an attraction at our home. Whenever one arrives, we host a dinner party and invite many of our closest friends and relatives. With your permission, I have read the letters aloud, and your sketches have been passed from one hand to the next, along with exclamations of, remarkable, such beauty. More than once, I've been told that you are the frontier equivalent of an Italian master studying human anatomy. 
Your sketches of the sable snarling teeth and clawed feet were among the favorites this last night, as were your studies of the alder cones and winter-killed grasses. Your letters, too, catch glimpses of this wild place that has become your home. You always did have a talent for expressing yourself, Mabel, and perhaps no other time in your life have you had such wondrous sights to express. Our only wish is that you would write more often. I do believe I will hold on to everything you send, and someday you should publish a book of your drawings and observations. There's something fanciful and yet feral about them. Along with your interest in this fairy tale, the Snow Maiden, I am reminded of the time you spent as a child chasing fairies in the woods near our home. As I recall, you slept more than one night in those great oak trees, and when Mother found you the next morning, you would swear you had seen fairies that flew like butterflies and lit up the night like lightning bugs. I remember with some shame that the rest of us teased you about seeing such spirits. But now my own grandchildren chase similar fancies, and I do not discourage them. In my old age, I see that life itself is often more fantastic and terrible than the stories we believed as children, and that perhaps there is no harm in finding magic among the trees. Your loving sister, Ada. So, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of fun because the, writing those letters back and forth, and I think there's only a handful of them, maybe six or so, as I recall, um, but it really, I enjoyed it so much that now I, I'm, I'm working on another novel, um, and I'm experimenting with using all journals and documents and letters um, and newspaper articles, and it's, it's been fun to try new voices and do that different thing, although I did joke with some of the women here that um, when I got news that about the Pulitzer finalists, I told my husband, I better just quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> It's a, wow, I don't know if I can outdo that, but I am working on another novel. Um, it's also based in Alaska, and this river that I have invented, the Wolverine River, I'm staying on that river, but I'm jumping back in time to the 1880s, um, and, and inspired by a true life expedition um, that went into the heart of Alaska up the Copper River, um, and, and was one of the first kind of transversing of the estate of Alaska um, by the U.S. Army. And it was an amazing, remarkable journey, um, but I'm going to make it hopefully more fantastical. And my premise is sort of to imagine that the indigenous fables and myths are alive and occurring as these men are going up um, the Copper River, but has now become the Wolverine River, so I get to do that. And as a part of that, it was really fun. One of the, um, there are definitely some perks to, to being a novelist now, and one of them was I got a grant to float the Copper River. My husband and I, last summer, just the two of us, did a float trip um, and we floated from um, Chitna, if any of you know Alaska a little bit, you can drive to Chitna. And the Copper River is where some of the most amazing salmon comes from. So if you eat Copper River sockeye salmon, that's the river that we were on. And we floated for a week to Cordova um, and went through glaciers and saw brown bears and seals. And it was an amazing journey. And the whole time I kept feeling a little guilty, like, really, this is my job now? <laughs> I can do this? Just a little bit how I feel when I'm at home now. I'm, I'm not at the bookstore anymore. My travel schedule just got too um, hectic. And now I'm at home working on this new novel. And at times I have to kind of pinch myself that this is my, this is my job now. <laughs> so it's been very fun. But now I'm, I'm really kind of hoping to open it up to some questions now. And I, I'm happy to talk um, on, but I would like to hear maybe some of the things that you're interested in when, you know, wanting to know about, whether it's story, things to do with the story um, or, or anything else. Are there any questions out there?